Welcome to Food Psych, a weekly podcast about intuitive eating, health at every size, and body liberation. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and I'm a registered dietitian and certified intuitive eating counselor. Join me as I talk with interesting people from all walks of life about their relationships with food and their bodies. Hey there, welcome to episode 117 of Food Psych. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and today I'm talking with Deb Burgard, who is one of the founders of the Health at Every Size movement, and I'm super, super excited to talk with her today and share it with you all. She is a therapist who specializes in body image, eating, sexuality, health, and relationship concerns, and she helped bring into the world the Health at Every Size model, like I said, also the bodypositive.com website, and a book called Great Shape, The First Fitness Guide for large women, as well as numerous book chapters and research articles. She's so well-respected in this field and has really provided a lot of support and guidance to me and many of my colleagues on our journeys to becoming health at every size clinicians. So I'm really psyched to talk with her in just a moment. Before we jump into that, I want to read today's listener question. It's from a listener named Mani who writes, I have a history of binge eating and I'm currently struggling. How should I fit in food around work, especially as I work in the gastronomy industry? So shifts are mostly from evening, like around 5 p.m. until late, like midnight plus. We don't have time for a break in that time, and it's not really appropriate or reasonable to ask for a food break in this setting. How do I fuel myself appropriately while still being able to go to bed when I get home and not binge because I'm starving? Yeah, so that is a great question. And before I answer it, I just have to do my quick disclaimer that these answers are not meant as individual nutrition advice or medical advice. I'm not your individual dietitian. I'm just giving these for informational and educational purposes only, not to diagnose or treat any medical condition. So yeah, it's really challenging to fit in eating in some industries, and it sounds like you have a good sense at least that a way to prevent binging is to make sure that you're fueling yourself adequately throughout the evening. And that's great. That is a huge insight to already have because a lot of people who struggle with binge eating don't even recognize that eating enough and feeding themselves consistently and not going too long between eating occasions is one of the huge keys to avoiding binging. So that's a tip for anyone listening who's struggling with binging and not aware of that yet. But for you, the listener who asked this question, it sounds like you really understand that and it's just a problem of trying to fit it in. And I don't know if your workplace has family meal. A lot of a lot of restaurants have that at the beginning of a shift where everybody will get together and eat something in the kitchen. And usually it's a pretty hearty meal. It's a good way to start off your shift and fuel yourself. So hopefully you have that. If not, maybe that's something you can institute at your workplace. But Yeah, it goes a really long time. So even if you have a really good, satisfying family meal, it's not going to last until you're done with your shift, right? You're going to need something else. You're going to need a snack or maybe a couple snacks and another meal or a couple, you know, whatever way it sort of shakes out, right? Because that's a long time. So if you don't have time for an official break and it's not really appropriate or reasonable, you said, to ask for a food break, I wonder if other people in your workplace eat at their stations when they're standing up and cooking. I guess you didn't say, I'm assuming you're a chef, but I don't know what exact part of the gastronomy industry you work in, actually. So if you're working as a server, front of the house, that's a little more challenging. But sometimes, you know, people in the back of the house will just eat something at their station real quick between services or take a bite as they're cooking or whatever. I don't know about the health code on that. I think you have to have your food, your personal food that you're eating away from the prep area and some capacity, but, you know, figure out a place like a shelf to put things on that you're eating or working on that's, you know, away from the food you're prepping, something like that. But that could be really helpful just to like have your snacks throughout the service. And if it's a question of feeling judged or, you know, like you're you're not you're doing something that everybody else is not doing or something like that, I think really work to challenge that, really work to just say, you know what? I don't care what anybody else is doing. I'm going to eat this food right now because I'm hungry. I know I need to fuel myself. Otherwise, I'll binge, right? This is a protection against binging. And so I'm just going to take care of myself and do this. And this is this is an act of self-care, right? So really try to establish that boundary for yourself. And if there is any 
trepidation about eating in front of other people, try to overcome that because it is really important and necessary for your self-care to eat more consistently. If you're working in the front of the house, it's a little more challenging, like I said, but I think even there you can find a way to get your snacks in, get your food in while you're doing a shift, even if that's having something on a shelf in the back. And when you go to the back to get the food to bring out to everyone, again, like having your sort of separate shelf that's away from the food service area where you can have something that you can nosh on, whether it's a plate of food, a snack, a bar, you know, something kind of portable is often good, right? Like a any sort of granola granola bar or a protein bar or there's myriad fruit and nut bars and things out there like that these days or something like a yogurt or like a single serve bag of chips or something that's just easy to grab and eat quickly. If it's a plate of food, you know, you might take a bite, go serve something, take another bite, right? You might not have a chance to actually sit down and eat the whole plate of food in one sitting and comfortably and, you know, feeling not too rushed about it. But I think it's better to do that, even if you're having to be a little rushed or a little furtive or feeling like you're cramming it in between things, than to get to the end of your shift and be ravenous, right? So I think it's a matter of doing the best you can with the situation you have, because it is a challenging situation. I know from having worked you know, in a very limited capacity in food service for a while, how challenging it can be. And I think oftentimes people are sort of expected to just figure it out because it's like you're around food all the time. So you might be just tasting as you go. Some of the people that I worked with in restaurants would take that approach. They would just like eat little bits of this and that and, you know, be tasting their food. And so not actually make time for a proper meal or snack, just sort of be noshing on little things throughout the day. That works for some people. It doesn't work for others, especially if you're not really eating enough to be satisfied with those tastes. So if you are in a part of the industry where you're tasting food a lot, I would say definitely taste as required for your job, but also try to make time for like a proper snack or a proper meal because those little tastes don't necessarily add up to real satisfaction. And so that might not be enough to get you through without feeling like you're going to binge either. The other thing I would just say is you said that it's you don't feel like it's appropriate or reasonable to ask for a food break in this setting. I wonder where that's coming from. Is that an assumption that you've made based on how people operate so far in this situation? Does it really feel like that's true? Or do you think that there's some wiggle room there? Do you think you could actually open up a conversation with someone, your boss or whoever, like your supervisor, about this issue you're having? And I think advocate for yourself because if you do have a history of binge eating, this is a medical condition, right? This is a health condition that you have. And the environment that you're in is exacerbating and aggravating this health condition. So I think speaking up for yourself, asking for what you need, advocating for yourself and saying like, look, I know maybe this isn't seen as appropriate here. This doesn't seem reasonable given our schedule here, but I have this condition. It's really worsened by going long periods of time without eating. I need to figure out a way to make time for eating. And if you try the things that we talked about earlier and it's just not working, like, maybe that's the time to ask for this, right? And just to say, like, I recognize that this might be seen as sort of a weird request, but it really is for my health. And let's see if we can figure this out together, right? And I know that some workplaces in the gastronomy industry can be very patriarchal and militaristic and full of people who don't understand feelings, right? I've heard heard some chefs talk about workplaces like that. So, I get that it's really sometimes challenging to ask for what you need in a situation like that. If that's the case, if you have a boss that's really like, you know, you're scared to talk to about this stuff, you're scared to open up to about your health condition, and you don't even have to say necessarily what it is. You could say you could say you have a blood sugar issue, which it kind of technically is because when your blood sugar gets too low, that's when you start to have the binge urges, right? That's what's physiologically happening, actually. So you could just say, you know, I have a blood sugar condition. I have to manage it by eating more frequently. And so protect yourself, right? If you think the person that you're going to try to talk to about this is not a safe person, Don't push it. Don't reveal too much about yourself and then feel unsafe, but reveal enough to show like, hey, this is a serious issue. I need to deal with this. And 
I don't know where you're located, but if it's in the U.S., they actually have to honor a medical request. If it's something that you have especially like a doctor's note for or something like that, it's really worth a shot. So if you feel like you'd be more comfortable getting a doctor's note too, like going to a doctor who knows about your history, whether that's a physician, a therapist, someone else you've worked with, a dietitian, like, you know, getting a note from them and saying like, hey, this person has this condition where they really need to eat every X number of hours or whatever, you know, just sort of get them to spell it out for your supervisors. That can really go a long way, too. So to recap, don't be afraid to be the person who is eating meals and snacks during your shift. Just figure out a way to get the food off to the side somewhere safe so that you're not going to be dinged for a health code violation or something. But make sure that you're able to get it as needed throughout the service. If that doesn't work, if it's just not happening, you're still not getting your needs met, advocate for yourself, talk to your supervisors, make sure they know it's a medical issue and that you really need accommodation for this. So I hope that helps answer your question and definitely feel free to ask any follow-up questions. And those of you listening, if you want to ask your own question to have it potentially answered on the podcast, please reach out at christyharrison.com slash questions. That's christyharrison.com slash questions. And then if you want a deeper dive into the principles of intuitive eating and health at every size, including answers to hundreds, literally hundreds, more questions about these topics, you can join my online course, Intuitive Eating Fundamentals. It's a 13-week course that helps you make peace with food, learn to trust your body, break down the diet mentality once and for all, and really come to a place of body acceptance and peace with food and movement. It has a private Facebook group where you can connect with fellow participants from around the world. So if you're looking for community on this intuitive eating journey, it's really wonderful for that. And then I do a monthly Q&A for participants where I answer questions on intuitive eating, whatever specific questions have come up for participants in the course, and that could be you. So you can ask me literally anything about intuitive eating and health at every size and your journey, and I will answer it in a monthly podcast that I do exclusively for course participants. So you can't get this content anywhere else. And it's hours and hours of me answering questions about intuitive eating, including yours. So you can learn more and sign up for the course at christyharrison.com slash course. That's christyharrison.com slash course. I also wanted to share that I'm giving a seminar this week for fellow health and wellness professionals about how to market and brand your body liberation, health at every size, intuitive eating business online. And you can learn more details about it at christyharrison.com slash seminar. That's christyharrison.com slash seminar. It provides continuing education credits for dietitians. And it's a great way if you're looking to sort of move into this world of health at every size with your career to figure out how how to message and market yourself in this way that won't be triggering to your potential clients and that will actually be helpful to people who are looking to improve their relationships with food. So again, you can learn more and sign up at christyharrison.com slash seminar. And now without any further ado, let's go talk to Deb Brigard. I have to note that the sound quality on this one is not the best. This is not our usual high quality sound. Deb had some issues with her microphone, and so we ended up having to record through her computer speakers. So it's a little suboptimal, I would say, on the sound quality, but I love what she had to say and wanted to air this because I just think it's so valuable and important. So please forgive the wonky sound on this one. And if you grab headphones, it actually sounds a lot better than if you listen to it through a computer speaker or a phone speaker. All right. So now let's go to our conversation. So tell me about your relationship with food growing up. Hmm, that's a good question. I was growing up in the 60s and watching a lot of the people around me try to diet, including my parents. And I was also kind of aware of my own body, sort of how people were looking at me, including my parents. <laughs> that matter. And so I was really exposed a lot to the idea that it wasn't it wasn't good to have a body that wasn't delicate if you were a girl and slender. And so I saw my parents doing a lot of dieting, doing a lot of yo-yo, you know, kind of up and down with their weights. And there wasn't so much of that for me personally, probably until I got into my teens. But I do remember kids on the playground calling me fat sometimes. And that's a whole story in and of itself. It's 
kind of funny to me now. So I did, I had, I discovered some old journals and things like that. And there were definitely, especially again, when I got into my teens, like in seventh grade, I started, I used to make posters of things and I did a drawing for the refrigerator about these sort of diet slogans at the time. And I thought, oh my gosh, I hope anybody saw this now. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's like such great blackmail, you know, like, <laughs> like Dear Seb Regard with the Weight Watchers slogan on her on her. <laughs> seventh grade, you know, refrigerator. It shows how, how much it really had hold of you at the time, huh? Oh, God. I mean, I think I was, I was definitely worried about this shift in my life because I think I felt kind of powerful as a child. I think I felt really listened to by my parents. And I think I liked a lot of my teachers and I, you know, I liked people and I was kind of a powerful little girl and got to be the age where I was starting to get these messages about what I would think of people kind of like, that's just not good. You better, you know, kind of tone yourself down or, or, you know, lose weight or not be so exuberant or somehow be liked by boys, essentially. And, you know, I was kind of like, what? Like all this stuff that I had learned about it's great to be smart and it's great to be to speak up and to be brave and it's great to be sort of you know whatever fast and strong and all these other things that part of my childhood there was a, a pretty big disconnect there and I, I think I understood immediately that this is not a game I'm gonna be able to win you know like this is not where my strengths lie <laughs> clearly you know, conforming and, you know, being pretty for a boy, you know, and it just waiting for them to call you on the phone, you know, it just wasn't going to be a game that I could play very well. But I do remember those years, my mom taking me to Weight Watchers with her, with all good intentions. And I remember at one point, a couple of years into this process, I was, I was coming up from school and I was starving. And I remember I was like a bowl of cereal or something. I was just, dude, me. And my mom was coming downstairs and she just looked at me and she was like, oh, honey, just don't want you to have this problem. And I've had this problem all my life. And and I remember saying to her, mom, just stay out of it. And she looked at me and kind of nodded her head and she said, okay. And she really did. She backed off at that point. And I just had this intuition that I was going to be able to figure this out if she didn't get in my way too much. He thought that was probably right also. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Which is like, this is the great good fortune of having the parents that I had, you know, even though they were so kind of swept into this themselves, they had so much respect for me that, and they had sort of like this awareness that they didn't know what the answers were in this regard. And they allowed me to affect them as I got older, you know, in my young adulthood, when I started really taking hold of all this stuff and sort of making it like by the time I'm 19 in this story, I'm shaking my head and going, you know, after losing pounds over the summer, you know, like my usual weight cycle sort of happened. And and I was back at college and I was thinking, uh, why am I doing this? It really just occurred to me, like, I had the people in my life that I wanted to. I had more relationships than I could. Actually, I had to figure out who I was going to break up with (laughs) that fall. It was like, you know, in too many relationships. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and I was was just feeling kind of full of myself again. And it wasn't because I had lost weight. It was because I was who I was. And... And I had tremendous privilege. That's the other sort of aspect of this to notice. I mean, it's just, I'm sitting there going, you know what? I have other ways of being powerful and I don't need to do this. And it's never going to be my strong suit. And, you know, what am I doing to my body? I mean, that really was one of my thoughts. It's kind of like, this can't be good for my body. And I just thought, that's it. (laughs) (laughs) And honestly, that was what, 1959, 40 years ago. Wow. And I just said, fuck that. And so it took me a while to kind of think about the issue politically. And I do remember hearing about people working on fat fat activism when I was still in college. 
like in the late seventies. I started hearing about the Fed Underground and Napa and thinking about all of this sort of cross culturally and you know, what's going on with our culture. This is so weird. And, you know, just the the height of the second wave feminist, you know, wave was happening. And so it was just God, it was so lucky to be there at that time. It was great. And I was doing my undergraduate research for my psychology degree on women's sexuality and how women felt about their sexual responsiveness in different ways and kind of what the menu was that people did in heterosexual relationships, you know, and how women felt that worked for them or didn't work for them. And, you know, whether they blamed themselves or whether they blamed the menu or, you know, just all these issues and things that people were talking about then that were really fun. And it took me a while to figure out what my next step was going to be to go to grad school. And by the time I was doing that, I had sort of broadened my thinking a little bit to say, I'm really interested in how women feel about their appetites and how we learn how to feel about our appetites. You know, I was really thinking, how do we pull that apart and, you know, understand that better. So it sounds like you had a real grounding in feminism and social justice also. Yes, social justice that was sort of limited by the ways that it was limited in the second wave. I mean, I had kind of look back on that and there's incredibly important voices that were part of that, that were minority voices at the time, you know, because it and it still is the problem that we're these mostly white <laughs> movements. And I'm so glad to see that, you know, there's this willingness to sort of push past all the limits of that, even though I think it's, it's like people have been suffering this whole time, kind of waiting for us to get our shit together around this, you know, and not be so harmful. And there's people who are really trying to work on that, which is important. Totally. And intersectionality was was happening, right? It yeah. was born in the 70s or maybe the 80s, right, with Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde and those folks. I can't remember whose who's word that was first, but... Yeah, she's a lawyer, and she was bringing a, I'm trying to think of her name, too, she was bringing a lawsuit on behalf of the Black women employees of an organization that wouldn't let them be front office employees. The courts basically said that, well, they're not being discriminated against on the basis of race because there are Black employees who are men who are working in the warehouse and there are white employees who are women who are working at the front office. So you can't say that there's discrimination here. And that was why she came up with this idea because it was so frustrating that the law didn't really grasp the lived realities of people's lives. You know, like this was something that people could kind of pull apart in that way. And I'm sorry to be blanking on her name at the moment. I'll look for it and put it in the show notes after this, too, because that's a that's super important, I think, for people to understand, like the origins of intersectionality. That's really cool. I didn't I didn't actually know that story. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we you know, we didn't really have a mainstream concept of intersectionality back then, which was that being a black woman or a trans woman or a disabled woman or, you know, someone with multiple identities that are being mm -hmm. oppressed is different from being a white woman and a white able-bodied woman and a white cis woman and a what you know, like having all the privileges, right? Right. Because basically whatever the dominant group is, and this is really true. When I was growing up, I remember, you know, my parents were pretty, I'm a white, I'm a white person and my parents were white and, you know, they were sort of like, Kennedy Democrats at the time, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they were, if that means anything, anybody who's listening, who's so much younger now, but you know, they were basically really drumming it into me not to think of people as different from us, right? Like, so they were trying to combat the sort of stereotyping that was going on around Black people by solving that by saying everybody's like us, right? Instead of of kind of understanding that we had a position. <laughs> and, and so I grew up thinking I was basically clear, you know, like <laughs> I wasn't really white. I was clear. You yeah, know? the default. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing, right? That's the whole pattern is that if you're in the dominant group, you just sort of think of 
these things as abstractions and you don't think of yourself as having a designation in this structure, you know, a position in your in the structure that gives you privileges or takes away privileges. And I think that's, again, as a person that has this mixture of things happening in my own life, it's always clear. I don't, you know, I mean, there's sometimes I know why something is happening. You know, it's based on this thing that this particular thing, you know, or it's based on that particular thing. But most of the time, I think for most people, you don't know. When you're rejected, you don't know because of this or that or the other thing. You don't think of yourself that way. Right. People aren't saying it overtly. Not necessarily. Yeah. Unless it's, yeah, the overt discrimination and the hatred that people feel, especially online now, is a whole other story that's more direct. But yeah, the subtle, the subtle ways that people are discriminated against. Kimberly Crenshaw. Oh, yes. Awesome. So, yeah, we'll make sure people get that. Totally. Yeah, I'll link to her work in the show notes or, you know, a primer about intersectionality or something so that so that people can learn more. Because we throw that word around a lot on the podcast and I talk about the concepts of it a lot without really getting too detailed into the history. So I think it's helpful to learn more about it. In present, when someone has heard a sort of more academic conversation where people are saying intersectionality is the concept of blah, 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 <laughs> and they basically say, it's not a concept. This is my life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, 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 don't, like, this is, again, in making things that are really impacting people's bodies, you know, sound really abstract, mm-hmm. <laughs> right, is also part of the problem, too. Mm, definitely. Yeah, because there is sort of the intuitive nature of a lived experience of being a certain identity is something you don't really need to distance yourself from academically. It's just, it's that Mm -hmm. person's lived experience. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I'm curious how you started to understand, at least it sounds like you were starting to understand back in college and grad school, the sort of identity and oppression around being in a fat body and what, and the fact that there was an alternative to that, which was the burgeoning fat liberation movement at the time. Yeah, it was tiny. <laughs> I mean, like, like, I don't think there was a whole heck of a lot going on politically that wasn't related to the feminism. And the feminism was being, the feminist movement was being critiqued partly about the sort of weight stigma in the feminist community. And there was a kind of when Fat is a Feminist Issue came out, which was Susie Orbach's book, it was a big discussion because she sort of says, what we do with our bodies is embedded in this need that women have to manage objectification. And there was a little bit of a, you know, you make yourself fat so that you can manage the male gaze more or less. You know? Right, right. So that you can protect yourself from objectification or something. Right. And so even though there's a powerful insight to that, there's also a lot of weight stigma in it as well, which doesn't mean that it doesn't happen for some people or, you know, isn't relevant to think about. But the fact of weight diversity as a sort of biological given, once again, is absent in that analysis. So it's sort of a normative position to think that everybody's going to be one size, except if you're living in a patriarchy, you have to make your body bigger so that you're protected, right? Like, it's like, what? You know? know. (laughs) So I think this is the fundamental, one of the fundamental problems is that if you start off with a presumption that people are supposed to be one size, then you get into all kinds of trouble in your worldview. If you think about people as being, you know, sort of just, you know, this is part of what human bodies do, you know, (laughs) like human bodies are incredibly varied in what they do with the building blocks that they get, right? Like there's all kinds of ways to use your building blocks and all kinds of ways to give your body an advantage, right? And Mm -hmm. when you give your body one advantage, you're going to do less with something else. So if you think about you know, are really oversimplified ideas about fuel and exercise 
and how we've always seemed to kind of have this black box idea that you have you know, X number of calories going in and X number of calories coming out. And, you know, people get into these big arguments about the laws of thermodynamics, you know, <laughs> it's like, well, you must be overeating because, you know, blah, 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 blah. I, you know, I try to do a thought experiment with people and kind of say, let's just do this. As, you know, I know this is impossible to do, but let's take a hundred babies and they're all different genetically. And let's imagine that you could completely, totally determine that they all got the exact same number of calories. Mm -hmm. And let's say, you know, we look at them in terms of their adult stature. And do you expect everybody to be the same height? Of course not, right? How does that taller kid get taller from those calories then? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, like, what happened there? You know, like, and it's kind of like, that's how silly this whole conversation is. Well, because that body did something a little bit different with its building blocks, you know, and it's not, you know, weight is as genetic as height. You know, we've known that for decades, right? This is not something that's, that doesn't have a huge genetic component to it. And so whatever's going on in that black box, you know, there's a lot of things, right? There's tissue repair, there's creating heat, there's fidgeting, there's building big muscles, there's learning how to be speedy. Mm. <laughs> right. Everybody's body's sort of natural energy expenditure is different and that's beyond our control. Right. And what they're doing, you know, people who are gifted at making fat from fuel are apparently the evolutionary winners. If you look at human history, because there's, I mean, given, I mean, this is completely arbitrary that, that people are defined, two thirds of the population is defined as being over the normal weight, right? <laughs> right. But if you just look at that on the face of it, to me, that's pretty funny, because it sort of means, well, who won that evolutionary draw? <laughs> right, exactly. You know? And it makes so much sense that, that we would be wired that way as a species. Right, the people who survive. I mean, if we hadn't evolved under circumstances where food was scarce for probably most people, you know, in our, if we go back to our ancestry, if we had not evolved under those circumstances, maybe you wouldn't have selection for genetic gifts of making fat from fuel, right? You would have something else. But, you know, clearly for a lot of people, for a lot of lines of ancestry under a lot of different parts of the world, that's been a really big problem. And, you know, everybody acts like this isn't really an issue anymore. And just, you know, we, we all know how to get enough to eat. And I'm, you know, watching what's really going on with our planet. And it's like, you know what, I think biology may have more wisdom about this than we do right now. And to, to get rid of these genes is stupid. If we have an ability to weather different kinds of challenges environmentally, because we are the people who are the products of all those lines of evolution, I don't think it's a very good idea to just decide because you think thin people are pretty that we should just jettison this capacity in human bodies. Right. And pathologize something that kept us alive as a species, literally. We wouldn't probably have continued to exist if we weren't selecting for that ability. So that is a really important survival mechanism. Yep. And it's interesting, too, like you say, the sort of pathologizing of it is pretty new, right, in, in human history. It's within the last couple of centuries that we've started to have a thin ideal. And it's no coincidence that in that time, also, we started to have food production that could sustain the population more consistently, at least in Western culture, right? And we weren't so... I mean, of course, there was still poverty and hunger, but more people were in a social status that allowed them to have more regular access to food, and therefore being in a larger body was more accessible than it had been. So the the rarefied ideal of having a larger body that was held up as like the beauty standard back in the day was now becoming more attainable, and the sort of wealthier elites were looking for a way to distinguish themselves. Definitely one of the hypotheses, for sure. And I think, 
I sort of feel like there's m- bigger gaps in what we know than we know. <laughs> mm-hmm. right. So that's I, it, it is a really interesting hypothesis. I don't know what I don't know about that. I don't know what other times were like with regard to this. I don't know even about every place on earth right now. You know, I think right now there's plenty of places on earth where there's a, just bewilderment about what the heck is wrong with you people? You know, like, <laughs> what's your obsession about this? You know, mm-hmm. that is true. It's a, it's a particular Western obsession and, you know, increasingly other parts of the world that are touched by Westernization too. So, you know, when you first were getting involved in fat activism or getting interested in it, did that kind of translate into how you related to your own body as well? Like, did, was it sort of like you gave up dieting and that was it? Or was there sort of a a dance with that? Well, so what you want, you might want to just remember that fat activism wasn't necessarily a thing exactly. You know, like it's kind of like there were these people that you kind of heard about, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if you, you know, if you knew, I mean, they were, when I moved to the Bay Area to go to grad school, it was 1983, and there were a couple people doing things that were really intriguing. Like there were some people, especially coming out of the queer community, they, a lot of the, you know, there would be big brouhaha's that would erupt over fat dykes marching in the pride parade like there was a lot of horrified reaction in the gay community sometimes from from thin men in the gay community kind of going oh this is terrible you know like i can't believe you expose us to your body you know and there were so there were people who were beginning to kind of go no this is glorious you know and we're going to march in the parade in our glory and you know people found themselves targeted for a lot of misogyny and a lot of fat phobia, even, you know, here and there. So we were beginning, I was beginning to see this, but mostly what happened was I started teaching my dance classes. That's really what happened when I kind of hit the ground in Berkeley and started going to grad school. And I just had, I had been studying West African dance, of all things, after I graduated from college, I had been studying with some teachers in Boston when I was still living there and just feeling so uplifted, really, by this tradition that wasn't as, I mean, the people who were teaching were kind of modeling this really different way of being in their bodies for me. I was watching my teachers just use their body size, whether they were, you know, tiny bird-like teachers or much larger people with much bigger hips and thighs and butt, you know, and we're just sort of really using every part of their flesh, you know, to kind of make a statement with their dancing. And to see somebody not hold that back, you know, and to not only not hold it back, but just really revel in it and know how beautiful it was. And for me, again, like these light bulbs are going off over my head, you know, I'm kind of like, I'm envious of this fat teacher. (laughs) You know, like, I am sitting here feeling puny in my body <laughs> like, like, this is really interesting you know because I've been feeling so kind of you know comparing myself to these you know norms that I'm supposed to be trying to get to that is not an experience that I had had before like or I was just kind of like god I wish I had that to move it that way you know like I just you know and it and so it was really it was one of the things that was a gift to me about people sharing their culture that way And when I got to the West Coast, I just was so aware of how few places there were for fat people to just move, you know, just enjoy moving and how weird that is. That's just so weird, you know, that there's just no place for people that isn't organized around punishment and weight loss and repenting. Right. (laughs) And being like, let me be less fat by going to this place. I was teaching my dance classes and they were called We Dance and we just had these fantastic, fun, exuberant dance classes. And 
I started meeting people there. I started meeting all these other people that who, you know, a lot of them went on and did a whole bunch of other things. You know, it was sort of like a, a little node in the network of, you know, how the story unfolds. People that I met was the person who had become my co-author. So Pat Lyons and I met each other. And she had, there was a little article in his magazine that was called, We'll Always Be Fat, But Fat Can Be Fit. And she wrote to the author of that article, and the author said, because Pat was a was an RN and a fat woman herself and an activist and a nurse and wanted to sort of think about health and fat people in a different way. And so she had written to this author, and the author kind of said, yay, nice to meet you. And I had this agent calling me because of this article. Do you have any interest in writing a book? Wow. <laughs> and so... So Pat was like, yeah, I do, as a matter of fact. And then, you know, she kind of found me because I actually had this program, essentially. You know, I had this sort of stuff that we could include as a kind of concrete thing to do in the book. But I was also, what we did together is still, I think, so radical. Because when I look at what's written in this book, you know, it's like we're basically saying, if you're a fat person, you don't have any moral obligation to exercise. (laughs) This is not what we're saying. You have no reason to address that bullshit at all. And here's what we're really saying. We're saying if you want to explore this for yourself, you have a right to environments that are free from weight stigma. Yes. Here's how you might go about kind of finding them, creating them, finding each other, right? This is what the book's about. Here's how you might go about looking inwardly, because I had been working with intuitive eating for years already, because I started doing that just after I got out of college. Mm. And so I was thinking about intuitive eating, intuitive exercising, you know, like, it, how do you use this process to go inward and find the thing that is resonating for you, at the same time that there's this cacophony of crap, outside of you that's saying you got to do this you got to do this you got to do this you know right Right. so this whole notion that you could sort of turn down the volume on this demand that was coming from the outside that puts us in this position where you have to be obedient or rebellious one or the other you have to kind of use all this energy to address this oppression right? Instead of being able to use your energy to kind of think about what is going to be good for you today, you know, what is what in your own wisdom of your own body is going to be good for you today. And use those principles in the book as well, which was also radical, I think. Yeah, what was your book called? Great Shape, the first fitness guide for large women. Mm. And in the hardback version in 1988. And as it has hilarious pictures of me, you know, <laughs> doing all the doing all the little movements and exercises and everything. And oh my god, that's awesome! <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, I love it. It is so. And it's so cool that the concept of intuitive eating and intuitive exercise really went together for you at the time too. Yeah, because yeah, I think it is like this. It's so different than that binary of either following the rules or rebelling against the rules, right? And I think that mm-hmm. a lot of people I see working with intuitive eating will have that period of rebellion, yeah. which I think is so yeah. natural, right? It's like the rubber band snapping back. Yeah. But then once they sort of reassure themselves that, yes, this food will still be available, you have access to it, you can you can have whatever you want and sort of start to really embody that, then it becomes possible to do this completely other thing. Right, right. That is so radically different. It's like off that binary completely. It's its own thing. And that's what intuitive eating is and intuitive movement as well. I think that's sometimes the final frontier for people with intuitive eating is learning how to apply the same kind of thinking to movement. And it's it's often, I see it being very tricky for people sometimes, especially mm-hmm. folks in larger bodies who've been really shamed, you know, like had a, had a lot of shaming or bullying around moving their bodies. Yeah, it's because it's trauma, you know, like I think that's the other piece of this that I think is, you know, the well-intentioned people that are trying to help people lose weight, I think can't see the legacy of all this stuff. We see the legacy of all this stuff, right? Which is that this is something that's just with trauma now. 
And this is associated with the feeling of being shamed. This is associated with something that's not at all pleasurable. And, you know, how do you kind of push all that back enough to create a space for people to consider what they might want to explore around this? Because, you know, it's such a triggery kind of <laughs> experience. So absolutely, I think, I don't think it's the final frontier. I think it's it's sort of like a pebble in a pond, you know, where you very often it's possible to start with working with the eating issues because that's what people are coming for help. Know, to, to deal with but I don't think you can kind of walk through that process and have it sort of begin to generalize to all these other questions about what do you desire and how do you tell what do you desire and how do you begin to reclaim the entitlement to have desire right and so I think of it as a developmental process I'm sure that you know you thought of that too like you're when you're being exposed to all this oppression around weight and dieting, you're being, you're like a child and you're just, you're just, you have to do what they say. You know, you just mm-hmm. have to. And then you're like a teenager, which is sort of like, I'm going to speak to the part of this that says that I'm not good enough. And I'm going to speak back to that by doing the opposite of what you're asking me to do. And there's a very important, healthy part of life that's represented there, right? It's kind of like saying, nope. I'm going to tell you no. I'm going to tell you no. And that needs to persist as long as it needs to persist. But at some point, there is some kind of energy going to that argument with the people who are trying to control you that is energy that's not available for your own use. And I think that's things get a little complicated. So you, you know, because cantaloupe was a diet food. <laughs> You know, it's a hot summer day and you're like, God, I'd love some cantaloupe. I'm so thirsty right now. And you think, oh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so like, you know, like this, this history does not have to keep you from your cantaloupe, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. That's so well said. Yeah. I think that's such a good metaphor to that developmental process because mm-hmm. a lot of people I see with intuitive eating get really scared when the sort of teenage rebellion phase goes on for too long. And I sometimes call it the honeymoon phase because it's like you're sort of in love with these foods that have been off limits and that's all you want to eat. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you keep going to them again and again, and they might not even taste that good after a certain point, but it's like there's still this sort of almost compulsive feeling of like having to prove to yourself that you can have it. Right. Because you've you've been fooled so many times before, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and and usually when people are doing this process, they're not a hundred percent there, right? Like I don't know anybody who's not ambivalent, right? So you still have some part of you that's kind of tut tutting and non and and anxious, and you know this is this is going to be terrible, and you, this is dangerous, and you know does this person really know what they're talking about? And I you know, uh, you know like they're just kind of. That's something that you know is happening inside of you, whether it's conscious or not, right? And so the part of you that's got access to these foods is kind of holding their arms around all of these foods, you know, and it's, that's going to last as long as that it has power, right? If, if you can really give that part of you power and the power to, s- to have a conversation with the other part, you know, that's, that's important, you know, that you, every part of you has wisdom and nothing is going away in any of this process. Nobody's going away. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah, this is not going to be taken from you. But your job description may change. Your relationships with the other parts of yourself are going to change. And the relationships between those parts is really the big picture issue here. The, The relationship is what makes you feel safe or not within yourself. I'm not talking about the the, the dangers outside of us. I'm talking about within ourselves, do we have our backs? Do we know that we have our backs? And is there a kind of democracy there between the parts of us that have these little pieces of information about the wisdom? Like you can't can't have a dictatorship and have it feel good. Right. That's a... Great point. And I love that metaphor, too. Because, yeah, these parts don't go away, right? We're going to have the parts of us that question, the parts of us that are still adhering to diet culture that will persist for a while, maybe even always, you know, maybe there will always be those voices to some degree. But if you can sort of be the 
strong democratic leader, if that part can be sort of strengthened and given more voice and reassurance, that's what it takes to to get past having the other parts drive the bus. I do think there's the same dynamic on all these different levels. I really do. I think there's the same thing happening inside of us that we see between people. And I think the same thing between people is happening between groups of people. And I think the same thing that's happening on nation state levels are the things that are happening between groups of people, right? Like you're, like all these things are just how we are organized as the social part of how we're organized. And so, yeah, no, nobody's going away. And what is possible, and we don't want anybody to go away. That's the other thing that I think is really confusing for people. You can see it happening on a political level. You can see it happening on a village level. You know, there's, there's sometimes this attempt to just shun <laughs> or eject, <laughs> you know, somebody, right? And, and that's, I think, actually part of what we see with people's experience of the fat self, right? It, it's kind of an experience that because we live in a culture that, that gives so much meaning to the idea of fat, pretty much everybody has a fat self in their subways, right? It's the self that's what you free associate to when you hear the word fat. You know, it's kind of like all those traits that are taught to you as representative of that, the vulnerable part of you, the needy part of you, the part that's worried about rejection, the part that feels just sort of needing comfort and being out of control, you know, like all these things that are just existential human things, they get caught wrapped around this idea of a certain body size. And so that part of us is, is really precious. That part of us is incredibly precious and it has wisdom. You know, it has wisdom about this is what it feels like to be hurt. And this is what it feels like to not have an answer and to feel desperate or to, you know, these are things which allow us to really respond to other people who are hurt <laughs> with kindness and love as opposed to ejection. You know, like you're going to you know, get away from me. I'm one of the winners. Get out of my path. You know, like you go away. And if you're doing that within yourself, you're more likely to do that with other people. There's research on this. Like if you are holding these ideas about the worthiness of thinness for yourself, you are going to leak out in some way, probably. <laughs> yes. So these, again, these things are sort of all happening on these levels that are the same pattern over and over, which is really cool. You can take things that you learn from one level and use them in another level. Like how I, I use these metaphors all the time in therapy or talking about you know, how do you become more democratic internally? You know, everybody to vote. How do you stop gerrymandering this district? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Oh, that's so true. Because we, I mean, we live in a culture that really puts this primacy on confidence, self-assuredness, invulnerability, right? Yeah. And we sort of cut off that part of ourselves that feels, yeah. and especially those of us who are highly sensitive, right? If you're someone who feels things extra deeply, there's even more shaming around that and sort of overtly being told. I mean, like I was told throughout my life growing up as a highly sensitive person, like you need to grow a thicker skin or you're overreacting or, you know, all of these things that sort of attempt to shut down. Mm -hmm. And I think parents and parent figures who do that are are trying to act in a child's best interest most of the time. They're trying to like shape and prepare a child for this world that is really hostile to sensitivity. But unfortunately, that's not actually helpful. You know, it's it's coming from a good, a well-intentioned place, but it's not effective because it just serves to to do that in us too, to to have us do that to ourselves. And yeah, and I think it's a very gendered thing as well, right? Like you think about, well, in whose interest is it to raise children who are going to not have access to this part of their being? And, you know, when you think about, I think about even, I think about all these examples, I think about the draft and I think about raising boys and men to be so cut off from that part of themselves that they can go murder other people. Yeah. <laughs> you know? 
And I think about in the UK, we were, I was just in a little conversation online recently about boarding school and, you know, how the upper class people sort of have this built in attachment trauma, you know, where they send their six and seven year old kids off to boarding school and they are becoming the captains of industry. And they are the, you know, they're the, going to be the ones that are making these decisions that help a bottom line that affect thousands and thousands of people's lives. And, you know, it's sort of like, how do you just shut off that part of a person, you know, so that they're capable of prioritizing making money, right? And there, there's just examples of this, like, you know, in, I just think we just have to keep asking, in whose interest is it that we not have our sensitivities? That's a great point. Because it, I mean, yeah, to to be able to go to war, to be able to just care about the bottom line and not about people requires so much cutting off from empathy and from yeah. human sensitivity that like, I think we all have the capacity for, we're all born with, right? We all have, have it in us to be sensitive and compassionate, but some people are, it's an adaptive technique or it's a it's an adaptation to circumstances and expectations that some people end up cutting themselves off from it and that society foists that on people too yeah yeah once again i have humility in the face of i don't know if we're all born to do that but i certainly know (laughs) (laughs) i certainly know that environmentally there are things that are happening to people that basically traumatize them and and when you're when you're traumatized and you're not healing from that, there's going to be a a kind of a place where the scar tissue doesn't transmit the vibration, you know? And I, sometimes I think of us as like drums, you know, and I'm working with somebody and I have this sort of weird experience of something, (laughs) something on, I'm a therapist rather than a physician. So I'm not really doing the re the the sort of reflexes, you know, test, but, (laughs) I'm sort of thumping on different things as we're talking and I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of sensing, okay, that just was a dead spot, you know, and that's, oh, there you go. There's a good reflex or there's a resonance or it's a weird kind of set of data that I'm not very conscious of, I don't think, but I'm kind of trying to see where is their freedom to resonate and where is there not. And I think those those things that hurt us, if we don't get a chance to heal them, they can get frozen up, you know? Totally. Yeah. And I think the, I mean, I've seen this a lot with clients and I know I went through this myself too with my own eating disorder where the things that get frozen up, you look for coping mechanisms to maybe ease the pain of that or to help you freeze the thing, right? That like it's, the coping can take the form of, numbing with restricting food, for example, or taking your mind off of things by being so obsessed with restricting food or overexercise or binging or whatever. And and so then when you sort of address that surface level problem, right, of the symptom that's causing you pain of the eating disorder or the disordered eating and start to lessen that, the pain underneath starts to come out more. And that's actually, that can be so so scary you know i i think it's so normal to be afraid and to feel like something is going terribly wrong when that happens but i think that's actually a sign of healing right oh it's so poignant to me it is it is one of the most incredible aspects of getting to do this work with a person you know to sort of be walking along and kind of understand yeah the novocaine is wearing off here and can we together make a safe enough kind of container to kind of keep keep moving and just having enormous respect for you know these calculations that people are making internally you know that say i can go this fast and no faster <laughs> you know yeah. and Oh, I'm so mad at myself that I can't X, Y, Z. And you kind of, you know, why can you just do hypnosis with me? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of like, um, I don't think that's really what we should be doing. You know, like if we're saying that we respect all these different parts of you, there's a part of you that's deciding how fast to go here and that's okay. You know? Yeah. And that, yeah, it's like, 
to give up that coping mechanism before you're ready leaves you really exposed and vulnerable. And so maybe you're not ready to do that all at once or right away. Yeah. And I think a lot of the mechanical kind of approaches to treatment and the hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. We've only got, you know, six visits or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The problem with that is that, you know, it's very rarely going to be the time frame for healing from these kinds of things. And I don't know what the answer is about what to do for the majority of people, because it's very clear that, that the, what we have right now is enormously expensive and intensive time-wise, you know, and that hardly anybody has access to it. I mean, that's really a problem. I mean, that's a huge problem. So I don't think it's really clear what the answer is, except when you have this sort of step one, step two, step three, you know, chop, get going, come on, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> it's just to me to be just woefully not acknowledging the person who's sort of in the middle of this and their own wisdom about what they're going to be able to do and when they're going to be able to do it. And they've already been, you know, shamed endlessly about having any of these problems. And so it just, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an issue, you know, it's an issue of how to do this work as a healthcare provider in the structures that exist that are so inhospitable to doing the work. Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious, you know, speaking of being a healthcare provider in this field, I want to make sure we get to talking about mm -hmm. your experience of being sort of present at the inception and helping create the health at every size movement and then seeing it kind of go more mainstream and some of the pros and cons of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That and body positivity. I mean, I have the, I have actually the trademark. <laughs> right. Yes. I talked to Connie Subchak recently and, and she was talking about how you both had this name body positive back in the day. Right. Yeah, we've been trying to protect each other, you know, from the giants <laughs> mm -hmm. who would have taken it. But yeah, I mean, I think the history of the Health at Every Size movement is really clarifying, partly because I don't think a lot of people realize that it was partly a solution for healthcare providers about what to do that wasn't weight loss. And that gets lost, I think, in a lot of discussions because a lot of people are using it for their own purposes. You know, they're using it in their own lives personally. And, you know, they're sort of having these conversations about how, you know, what would this look like? And that's all well and good. And, you know, I think my work, I'm beginning you know, after 30 years or something, I'm beginning to kind of see there's a through line here in what I've been trying to do, which is to talk to the other healthcare providers and talk about this structure that we're embedded in and how do we not do harm? You know, how do we not do harm? Because w there were just more and more people, not just activists, not just artists, not just people from the fat community, but there were like my friend Pat, who's a nurse and, you know, the dietitians that were, you know, trying to figure out, well, you know, my my patients are not being helped by the thing that I was taught to do. The fitness people who are kind of like, this is really not good. You know, what I'm being told to do to make money is not really helping my clients. And the psychologists who are in the therapists who are basically saying, either we come from an eating disorder context and we totally see how the weight discrimination and weight stigma are, you know, killing our patients. And how would we ever get on board with prescribing for fat people what we diagnose as eating disorder in thin people. Right. <laughs> you know, like that, whoa, whoa, stop, stop. You know, like, what? Yeah, if you treat eating disorders, at a certain point, that thought has to occur to you, right? Well, you'd hope it would, but, yeah. you know, the sad truth is that it doesn't. You know, that there's an awful, like, when you look at actually the implicit attitudes of people who are treating eating disorders, they're pretty bad, you know, and the people who are supposedly quote unquote obesity experts, it's the worst of everybody, you know? And, but anyway, if you, if you are sitting there with any kind of conflict, you know, that sort of crosses your mind about this, you're basically saying, so what am I going to do? 
Like, what do I do? And so we were coming together to talk about this. It was so fantastic because we have things to do. I mean, if I'm sitting across from somebody who's thin, who's an eating disorder patient, and she's coming to me in distress about her body being too fat, I know what to do. (laughs) And it doesn't mean, it doesn't include put her on a weight loss diet. (laughs) Right. That's not what I was trained to do. You know, I have things that I can do. However, what is it that makes a therapist who is confronted with the distress of a fat patient, what is it that makes the therapist forget everything they know, you know, what what to offer somebody in this situation and just sort of go, yeah, yeah, we really just, you know, that, that's the first order of business. Just, just lose that weight and, you know, it'll take care of these problems, you know? Right. I mean, there's so much bias, right? There's so much bias in our healthcare system to start with that we're everybody's trained in a really weight biased medical model through school, but also just through life, you know, before you even go into the medical profession, you've already absorbed so much weight bias from the culture that it's probably very hard to unlearn, even if you're seeing a lot of patients in different size bodies with the same problem and sort of understanding that like, yeah, it's weird because I had this experience as well when I was first working as a dietitian. Like I worked in community healthcare and and I did some like workshops in low income communities about nutrition. And I was seeing people coming back to the workshops again and again, and sort of the star participants, you know, who come up to me afterwards and be like, I'm doing this, this and this, and I walked this many miles and whatever. And hearing some of these folks talk about it, I was struck by like, wow, this is kind of similar to how I used to think about food back in my eating disorder, but this person's in a larger body and they, you know, or like obese is what I thought at the time because that, you know, was using those stigmatizing terms. And I was like, yeah, so I guess it's okay for them, but not for me. And it just, I was like, I don't know how to square this, you know, and that was kind of the first seed of like, wait a minute, this, there has to be a different way. But, you know, at first I was kind of, it was just like a cognitive dissonance that I couldn't really understand. And so I just went about my life. Yeah. No, that makes perfect sense. I'm glad you had those thoughts. And I'm glad that you noticed that you had them. And I'm glad that you're the sort of scrapiness of that, you know, (laughs) (laughs) know, sort of like, you know, like that, 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 you know, one of the big brouhaha's in the last couple months has been this article that got published in the International Journal of Eating Disorders that was talking about comparing the picture of people in the weight, what is it called? The weight management registry. I think it's what it's called compared to people with anorexia. And, you know, the authors are really thoughtful, very well-known people who are sort of conducting this little thought, you know, this sort of little seminar in their paper, like, isn't this interesting? They have you know, the same physiological changes that we see in people with anorexia, these people in the weight registry, and they have the same thoughts during the day. And they have, you know, they have to eat similarly reduced portions, you know, as we see in in people with with anorexia. And and of course, we're not saying that they have anorexia. Right. (laughs) It's it's amazing how they were able to see that evidence and just almost put it together, but they couldn't quite say it, right? Like, you know, like, um, well, we don't don't know, we're not saying that. And I just thought, oh my God, this is the problem, right? Is Mm -hmm. sort of, if you don't understand that people come in all these sizes and that you could be weight suppressed, at a much higher weight than you would ever imagine. Like you don't look like you're emaciated, you know, you don't fall into any BMI category that is going to allow you to get diagnosed with anorexia according to the cutoffs now, which are stupid. That's a huge problem because there's, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in a plane at 40,000 feet and you lose an engine, but you don't really think it's a problem until you reach 10,000 feet, (laughs) you know, I have a whole heck of a long time that you could have righted this problem before you take any action, before you recognize that it's a problem at all. And that's why people die, is that their disease gets entrenched and people who are genetically vulnerable are going to be relentless. They're going to be relentless. And that relentlessness is a gift in some 
some contexts, and it is a tragedy if the eating disorder ideology wraps around it and, and takes it over. It's like, it's like taking over the food supply. You know, it's like a cancer that takes over that food supply. And the people who are really, really relentless are going to be the ones that are, quote, successful, unquote, whether they started at pounds and end up at or whether they follow and end up wherever. You know, it's like it doesn't really matter where you start. It doesn't matter. It matters whether your body is imperiled and your psyche is imperiled and your life force is imperiled and your ability to have a life that isn't organized around this stuff is at risk. Totally. Yes, that's that's very well said. I love that analogy of like the plane and losing an engine because it really doesn't matter where you are in the sky when that happens, right? That it it's a problem any way you slice it if you're losing an engine, but if you're if you catch it soon enough, you can address it without it being something that, you know, is a lifelong struggle for somebody. But unfortunately, people in larger bodies are applauded for it. And it's not looked at as I mean, that's one of the things I'm trying to change with this podcast is to say, like, anyone who's presenting with these symptoms, or anyone mm -hmm. listening who's experiencing these symptoms has disordered mm -hmm. eating or has a problem with their relationship with food and their body, whatever you want to call it. And it doesn't matter what size you are. It matters how it's affecting your life. And you can change that, you know, you have the power to change that. Right. And what's really complicated is that there are reality issues for people in bigger bodies in terms of the stigma that they're facing that create a real dilemma for those people, right? Because they're facing an oppression that's real and they are trying to figure out what to do about that, right? And so I think that's why it's not ever going to be enough for us to just work with individual people. I think we have to, if we want to prevent eating disorders across the weight spectrum, we have to make it safe to be the size your body needs to be across the weight spectrum, right? We just need to make it safe. If it's safe to be the size your body needs to be, then this stuff, it's sort of like my 19-year-old self, right? It's kind of like me kind of saying, you know, I know you want me to do this, but why should I? Right now, the oppression that people are facing is so real about this that it becomes, it's a compelling argument to sort of leave the stigmatized group, you know, like, and, to, and to think that you, and, and of course, it's partly a fiction that people that we have ways for people to change their body size that much right right and that's part of the problem too but and it's also part of the problem that there's a lack of imagination and a lack of access to representation of stories of the lived experience of people in bigger bodies that would give people hope that they could be okay also even facing the oppression that we face, that they could be okay, that they could be more okay using their energy to fight the stigma than using their energy to try to leave a stigmatized group. <laughs> right. Yeah. And how do we do that? I mean, when your work with individuals and also your work with ASDA, the Association of Size, Diversity and Health, and other just sort of being a part of this movement for a long time, like what have you found is effective in painting that different picture for people? Well, I have to say that I think one of the things that happened for me going all the way back to the women's movement is this notion that when people find each other and they start talking about their feelings and they start talking about their lives and they start being drawn to each other and they start kind of understanding that they're not alone and they begin to sort of be able to sort of triage <laughs> I believe this because I've been told this, not because it's true. And now I'm telling you, I see why you're saying that, but I don't think it's really true about you. And people are beginning to question all this stuff and put two and two together and understand where these ideas are coming from. And the fact that we find each other and we fall in love with each other is everything, 
right? I just can't believe these ideas about fat people that come through the quote-unquote obesity model because that's not who we are. I know who we are because I'm in community with who we are. And I'm in community with all these people and they're amazing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I can't even believe it. I think we should study us because we're so resilient, you know, in so many ways. We're still, we're so traumatized by these things and we're so creative about what we're doing to survive. And, And people who are oppressed have always had this mixture of incredible creativity and and resilience in the face of this stuff, even as some of these stories are undoubtedly, you know, awful, right? They're tragic, Mm -hmm. they're they're terrible, they're horrible waste of human life, you know, what we have to put up with. But but to me, the, the story of human life is not written under optimal circumstances. It's never been written under mm-hmm. optimal circumstances, right? You know, and so if I kind of think about this, this connects me to other human beings. This connects me to people across the ages who have done what they could think of to do with what they've got to work with. And that's a completely different way of thinking about my connection to the, uh, to the other human beings than I'm perfecting myself. And becoming better than everybody else, <laughs> you know, like that, <laughs> right? That what am I? I'm supposed to do what? Like, why would I do that? You know, like that seems really dead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when you're in community with people who can support you and sort of hold up a mirror for how good you really are and how whole and perfect everybody already is not perfect in the perfectionistic sense but perfect Mm -hmm. in the sense that like you don't need to change worthy exactly you know that that can help counteract the outside stigma and pressure yeah i mean i think it really is i think the most radical experience you know is to stop dealing in cartoons right and sort of have a real relationship and having the real relationship you do you see everybody's struggle and you see everybody's creativity and their stubbornness nevertheless she persisted (laughs) 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 and uh you know and and just kind of it just comes alive in this pageant that is so much more important and interesting than the the sort of thing that we're supposed to be paying attention to i mean to me it's like it could not be more rich and compelling. I mean, I think we're we're just finding each other. And when we do that, these things just open up. The joy of being in the mix of it all is accessible to us. And when we have that, we've got some energy. If we're not getting all that energy diverted into this other, you know, fruitless cul-de-sac of a process. You know, we've got energy to bring to this challenge and we have we have all the gifts to give. I think this is, you know, a sort of existential thing for human beings. Like if you if you get derailed from giving your gift because you're trying to wait to do that until you weigh a certain number, you're going to get sick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is really well said. Because we're here to give our gifts, right? And we're here to connect with each other and be a part of things. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful. And I think gives me a lot of optimism for this movement and where it's headed. And I think that's a good note to end on as well. So can you tell us where people can find you and learn more about your work? Oh, sure. Well, I have a very ancient website that needs... (laughs) Really needs to be updated. <laughs> you can all you can always find my phone number at the bottom of that page, which is <laughs> bodypositive.com. I think that will always be the case. So mm-hmm. you can always find me there. You can Google me and find me pretty easily these days. And I'm just so happy that the people who are who are your age and the people who are, you know, our the youth in our lives, (laughs) in both of our lives, the people who are sort of younger have kind of found this compelling too. And this is sort of the the hope for me is that there's people coming up, you know, who are taking hold of this in their own way 
and they're giving their gift, you know, by making this what is important to them. And that this continues to be, you know, a river where people are continuing to give their gifts. And I just, you know, to be a part of that is the most important thing to me to kind of feel like, wow, this was thing to be interested in. <laughs> yeah. Totally. I think I love that metaphor of the river and I feel so honored and grateful for this community too and for the work you did to pave the way for me to find all of this rich information and then that I can go and spread it further and that hopefully there's just more and more people who are going to be coming and you know this river will turn into an ocean and just take over the world. <laughs> well, let's forget that you know i'm not the beginning of that river by any means right like that river it stretches back and stretches back and stretches back and being able to jump in where you are and use what you've been able to to learn and take your take your turn at this work is just that's all i did it wasn't me right it was just me having a chance to get the ball down the field a little bit further, you know, and so all these people who made all these things possible before me are my teachers and are incredibly, and a lot of them are anonymous. Yeah. I'm grateful to them too. <laughs> well, good, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know to all of it, right? Because yeah, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have this movement without people paving the way and in lots of small ways that never were seen or acknowledged, you know? Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us and such such a pleasure talking with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So that's our show. Thanks again so much to Deb Regard for being here and sharing her story with us. And thanks to you all for listening. You can find full show notes for this episode, including all of the resources we discussed at christyharrison.com slash 117 for episode 117. That's christyharrison.com slash 117. And you can subscribe on iTunes if you haven't already. If you've gotten this from a share from someone's social media or whatever, go ahead and hit subscribe because that really helps us come up higher in the iTunes rankings and therefore reach more people. I and mean, we've been in the top 50 to 100 health podcasts now for months and months, which is really exciting. Like to be in the top 100 or 50 health podcasts on all of iTunes is a huge accomplishment. And I feel really grateful for that. And it's you all who are making that possible by subscribing and sharing and telling more people about the podcast on iTunes. So please keep it up. And if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and do that now. It really helps us out and helps more people find these health at every size messages that they really need to hear. We'll be back again next week with another new episode. And meanwhile, you can stay in touch on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're facebook.com slash food psych, and we're at food psych pod on Twitter. And you can follow my personal Instagram, Christy Harrison. The first I is a one, all one word, C-H-R-1-S-T-Y Harrison, for quotes from the podcast and updates from me. We don't have a separate account for the podcast, but my personal account has basically become the podcast account, and I share lots of great stuff from this show. The music you're hearing behind me now is by a band called AWOL, and the track is called Food, used under the Creative Commons license. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, stay psyched. Stupid or scared, no work in the kitchen now. 